Hello, my name is Mr. Asprey, and this is everything that you need to memorize for your Edexcel IGCSE maths exam. Memorizing formulas is really important so that when you go into your exam, you feel confident that you know everything that you need to know to answer every question possible. I think the best way of memorizing key formulas is to write it down in your own handwriting. So I've produced a copy of this document which has all of my workings on but I've also produced another one which is blank which I recommend that you fill out once you've watched this video and once you've committed most of this stuff to memory. You can access both the blank and the completed document on my Google Drive which I will link down below in the description. I've split the IGCSE up into 60 topics and I've numbered each one. This corresponds to my video which I created where I go through examples on every single topic and it also corresponds to my playlist where I go through exam questions on every single topic. Okay, let's get going. I'm going to clear off all of my writing on the sheet and then I'm going to go over it and I'm going to explain step by step how I remember each of these key formulas. Okay, let's get started. Number one, prime factors. The highest common factor, when we have a Venn diagram, we must multiply all the numbers in the middle of the Venn diagram. And in order to find the LCM, the lowest common multiple, we must multiply all the numbers in the whole of Venn diagram. Number two, fractions. To add fractions, we must find a common denominator. And when we multiply fractions, we just need to remember that we need to do the top times the top and the bottom times the bottom. When we divide fractions, we have to remember KFC. And this stands for keep the first fraction the same, flip the second fraction over, and then change the sign from a division to a multiplication. Introduction to probability. What we need to remember here is that the sum of all the outcomes always equals one whole. So when we add up all the probabilities, it's always going to equal 1. Uh, introduction to sequences. To find the nth term, we need to first find the difference between the terms. We multiply that by n, and then we add on the zeroth term. So this is the term which would be at the start of the sequence if there was another term prior. Okay, next up, constructions. So we need to have a compass. We put the needle point here, and then we draw a semicircle around like that. We then put the needle on the other side without changing the distance between the needle and the pencil and draw another semicircle there. And then we connect up the uh, two intersection points, and that gives us our perpendicular bisector. And to bisect an angle, we put our needle here and we draw an arc to get two points. We put our needle here and we draw an arc around. And then we put our needle here and we draw another arc around. And then we connect up the center of the angle with that intersection and we've bisected that angle. Number six, transformations. We need to remember that in order to describe a translation, we must give a vector. And that vector is always as a col column, like this, x, y. And the x is the, um, is the horizontal movement. And the y is the vertical movement. In reflection, we have to remember that it is reflected in a line. And most commonly, we have x equal lines, which are horizontal. And we have y equals lines, which are vertical. And of course, we could also have y equals x, which is a diagonal line. 
Rotation, there are three things you need to write for a rotation. We need to write rotation first. We need to write what the center is. We need to write what the angle is and also the direction as well. So that's either clockwise or anti-clockwise. And for enlargement, you need to know what the center is and you also need to know what the scale factor is. Okay, moving on to averages. The mean is the sum of all of the data points divided by the number of data points. The mode is the most frequent. The median is the middle when ordered. The range is the largest minus the smallest. And the interquartile range is the upper quartile, which is found in the free quarter position, minus the lower quartile, which is find, found in the quarter position. Okay, next up, frequency tables. So to find the mean from a frequency table, we must sum up all of the midpoints of the intervals multiplied by their respective frequencies and then we divide that by the total frequency so the sum of all of the frequency and the modal class is the most frequent class okay standard form it's very specific. It must be in the form of A times 10 to some power. And the A value, what you're multiplying by 10 to the power, has to be between 1 and 10. Okay, on to percentages. And if I want to find a multiplier for increasing, I take uh, 100 and I add on whatever percent I want to increase it by and I divide that over 100. And if I want to work out and multiply for decreasing uh, a value, I will do 100 minus whatever the percentage decreases, and then over 100. That gives me my multiplier. Percentage change, we work out the change in the amount, and then we divide it always by the original. We then multiply that by 100 to get the percentage change. Reverse percentages, if you want to work out the original, we take the new value and then we divide it by whatever the multiplier is. Okay, compound interest, we, to work out the new value, we take the original which we're investing we multiply it by whatever the multiplier is however much the percentage changes each year and we do that to the power of however many years we're investing for expanding brackets we might want to use the acronym FOIL it stands for first so you multiply the two first terms and then outside, you multiply the two terms on the outside. And then inside, you multiply the two terms on the inside. And then the last, you multiply the two terms that are last position in each bracket. And that will give you each term as required. To factorize, I need to find two numbers that add to B and times to make C. If I've got a value of uh, a coefficient of an x squared in my uh, quadratic, then I'll need to use the AC method, which I recommend you checking out on my video where I go through all of the methods. Uh, on to inequalities, 
Uh, these symbols, you need to know what they mean. I'm going to write them down now. So if it's pointing to the left, then it's less than. If it's pointing to the right, it's greater than. And if we have a little line underneath it, then it means less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. And if you divide or multiply by a negative number, then we must remember that this flips the sign of the inequality around. So a less than changes to a greater than and vice versa. Okay, when we're graphing inequalities um, and we have a, a line which is y less than mx plus c, then we must shade below the line. And if we have uh, a line which is y is greater than mx plus c, then we must shade above the line. And if you remember that, then we should be good for all graph inequalities. Simultaneous equations. I've got an example here on the side. You can see that the two y's are about to cancel. But what do we do? The signs are different. We must add the equations together. Like this. But if the signs are the same, then we subtract the two equations in order to get some cancellation here. Okay, on to indices. So important, this topic. If we have the bases the same, so both A and we're multiplying, then we add the two powers together. And if we're dividing, then we subtract the two powers. If we have a power of a power, then we multiply those two powers. If we have uh, A to the minus power, then that's the same as just 1 divided by a to that power. a to the 0, or anything to the power of 0, is 1. a to the 1, anything to the power of 1 is itself, so a. Uh, a to the 1 over n is the nth root of a. So if that was a uh, half there, then it would be the square root. If it was a third, it would be the cube root. And we can also include um, a fractional power like this, m over n. Well, the fraction on the bottom, n, does what we just said it did, which is to take the nth root. And the power on the numerator just raises it all to that power. It doesn't matter. You could do the square root first or the power first or vice versa. You'll still get the same answer. OK, measures. Um, a speed triangle. Um, S D T for some reason I remember it as silly dogs talk don't ask me why uh, density we have D we always got the mass on top that's how I remember that one and pressure is force on top and area down there on the bottom whatever you're trying to find you just cover up and then the triangle tells you what calculation you need to do Units, there are 1,000 kilometers, uh, sorry, 1,000 meters in a kilometer, and there are 100 centimeters in a meter, and there are 10 millimeters in a centimeter. And if we're converting not between linear units, but instead area units, we must take that scale factor and we must square it. So all these numbers in here need to be squared. And for cubic, uh, sorry, for uh, volume, uh, the scale factor needs to be cubed. So these would be cubed, these values here. Okay, moving on up to number 22. Which is angles. Okay, angles along a straight line adds to 180. Angles around a point add to 360. Corresponding uh, angles, when we have this type of F type, type structure, like I've shown here, they are equal. The two red angles there are the same. Alternate angles, when we have this Z type structure, again, these give equal angles. And vertically opposite, when we have this X-type structure, this as well means the two red angles are equal. Co-interior, when we have this C-type structure, the two angles are not equal, but they add to 180. 
angles in polygons, the sum of the interior angles is always n minus 2, so the number of sides minus 2, multiplied by 180. And if you want to find an individual one, you just divide that value by n. The exterior angles in a polygon, they always add up to 360, which is really useful because, again, if you want to find just one exterior angle, you just do 360 divided by the number of sides. And another really crucial one is that the interior plus the exterior always adds to 180. So if you know one of the exterior or interior, then you essentially know the other one as well. Bearings, these are always measured from north, and they're always measured clockwise. Back bearings are always differ by 180. Now, what do I mean by back bearings? If you know the bearing of getting from A to B, then the bearing of going from B to A, going back on yourself, is always going to be 180 different. Okay, next we're looking at Pythagoras' theorem, and if we have a right angle triangle, we can label the two short sides A and B, and the long side C. So to find the long side C, we need to do the square root of A squared plus B squared. But to find one of the short sides, for example A, I'll need to do A is equal to the square root of C squared minus B squared. Okay, trigonometry, Sokotoa, sine or sine theta of the angle is equal to O over H. Cosine, ka, is equal to A over H. And tan, toa, is equal to O over A. So if you just remember Sokotoa, then you should be able to recite those trig functions. Okay, area. Uh, parallelograms, I say parallelograms because that includes rectangles as well, are base multiplied by height or length times by width. A triangle is a half times by base times by height. Now the trapezium formula you are given, but again it's good to know it off by heart. It's a half of the two parallel sides added together multiplied by the gap between them, also known as the height. The area of a circle is pi r squared, and the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, or some people prefer pi times by diameter. Uh, volume of a prism, again, that one is given, uh, but good idea to memorize it anyway. It's the cross-sectional area multiplied by the height. And the surface area is the sum of the areas of all the shapes' faces. Volume of a cylinder, this one is given. It's pi r squared times by height. And the curved surface area is also given. It's 2 pi r h. But it's important to remember that the total surface area is not given. You just take the curved surface area and you add on the top and the bottom or the, the lid and the base. So that's two lots of the circular area. So that's 2 pi r squared. Okay, let's move up to the next one. And that is number 30, straight lines. Uh, equation of a straight line is y equals mx plus c where M is the gradient and C is the y-intercept. Uh, the gradient formula is given as M is equal to y2 minus y1, so the change in the y's, over x2 minus x1. So some people like to remember that as the run over, sorry, the rise over the run. Uh, the length of a line is essentially we're doing a Pythagoras um, calculation. So we're taking the change in the x values, squaring it, and adding it to the change in the y values, 
and squaring that, and then taking the square root of the final answer. And that's how you get the length of a line between two points. Now the midpoint of um, a line segment, we take the average x-coordinate, so we add the two x-coordinates and then divide them by two, and we take the average y-coordinate, so we add the two y-coordinates and divide that by two. Uh, two lines are parallel if they have the same gradient. Okay, sketching graphs. It's important that you know the shape of some of these graphs. Um, the first one is a quadratic, and if it's a positive quadratic, it has a U shape. And if it's a negative quadratic, it has an N shape. A cubic is, uh, or looks like this. And a negative cubic starts from the top and then ends down at the bottom. A reciprocal graph is a bit trickier to draw. Um, you first off will need a, uh, a set of axes uh, for reciprocal graphs. And reciprocal would look like this. And then it will also look like this down here. A negative reciprocal is just the sort of mirror image of that, so it just comes this side and it goes that side like that. And we also need to know what the sine graph looks like. So the sine graph starts at 0, 0, and then it just oscillates like this over 360 degrees. The cosine graph just starts up at 1 and then oscillates in the same fashion. And the tan graph is completely different. It starts off at 0, 0, goes up to an asymptote at 90, comes down from the bottom to hit there at 180, up to another asymptote at 270, and then finishes off from 270 to 360, down the bottom like that. OK, um, right, I've put here quadratics, because I think it's important to remember that there are three different ways of solving them. You can solve them by uh, factorization, which is the most common approach, but sometimes that doesn't work. And if that doesn't work, then you can solve them by using the quadratic formula. And you can also solve them by using completing the square. Now, the quadratic formula, you don't need to memorize this um, because it's given in your formula booklet, but it's a good idea just to write it down so you're familiar with it, it's minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, next I've got probability. I think it's really important to remember that if you ever say the word and when you're doing a probability question, then you'll need to multiply the two probabilities together. But if you say the word or, like this one or that one, then you will need to add the two probabilities together. And another little trick is at least one. So that's a question that comes up quite a lot. It asks you, what's the probability of getting at least one red, for example? And what you could do in that situation is always just do one minus the probability of getting none at all. So sometimes it's easier to work out the probability of getting n nothing of something and you just do one minus that, and that gives you the probability of at least one. Okay, on to the dreaded circle theorems. And this is the most sort of labor-intensive thing you'll need to remember. There are eight of them, which I recommend you learning, and you need to write down specifically the actual theorem in writing when given a question. Okay, number one, we have angles from the same segment are equal. Now, this one uh, looks like a little like a bow tie. So that's how I remember that one, and that's angles in the same segment are equal. We get a bow tie shape. The next one is the angle at the center is twice the angle at the circumference. And this one I remember because it looks like an arrowhead, and you have the angle at the circumference, and then the angle at the center is twice that. And the next one here on the left is that opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral add to 180. And the mistake I see a lot in students is they forget to write the word opposite. They just put angles in a cyclic quadrilateral add to 180, and they won't get that explanation mark. Um, and a cyclic quadrilateral means that the 
quadrilateral, each corner is touching the circumference of the circle. Next one over here on the right is that angles in a semicircle is always a 90 degree angle. And for this one, uh, the most important part is that the it's a semicircle, so the hypotenuse here must go through the diameter of the circle. Uh, the next one is that a tangent and a radii will always meet um, at 90 degrees. So a tangent is a line that touches the circle just at one point, and then if you draw a radius up to the center, that will always be a 90 degree angle. And the next one over here is that two tangents um, that meet will have the same length. I like to remember this one as the party hat theorem, because if I were to turn that hat kind of facing upwards, it would look like a party hat. Um, next one is the alternate segment theorem. This is when we have a tangent and then we have a triangle inside the circle. The angle that the tangent makes with the triangle is the same as the angle in the opposite corner. Uh, and the final one is that if we have two radii and form a triangle from it, then it's going to be an isosceles triangle. Great. So let's move on to chord theorems. And um, the common misconception with chord theorems is that there are two different formulas for um, if it's insects inside or if it's insects outside. In fact, it's exactly the same formula. So we take A and we multiply it uh, with A to P, which is the distance from A to the intersection point, and we multiply it by B to P, uh, which is the other distance on the other side of the chord. And that's always equal to uh, C to P multiplied by D to P. And that's the same if the intersection point is outside of the chord as well. Okay, moving on. Okay, so 38 is set theory, and if there is an N between A and B, then that represents the intersection. Now, the intersection are all of the elements that occur in both A and B. So they must be in both A and B. Whereas if there's a U between the sets, then that's the union. And that represents the set of all of the elements which are in either A or B or both. So the union is way more inclusive. It's definitely going to have more elements than the intersection. Uh, a with a dash means that all the elements that are not in A. Uh, this circle with a line for it means the empty set. And this Greek letter epsilon here means the universal set, which are all of the elements that we must consider when drawing our Venn diagram or, or creating our sets. And if I see an N and then brackets a set and then close brackets, this represents the number of elements in A. So it's not asking you to list all the elements of A, it's asking you to count and tell me how many elements there are in A. And finally, this uh, notation doesn't occur that often, but it, it, it can do, and it means that A is a subset of B. So all the elements in A are also contained within B. Okay, moving on to proof. Now, if I need to prove that something is even, or if I want to set up a proof where I'm using even numbers, then I will do two times by a natural number. So we call that 2n. So even numbers are two times by a natural number. And it may be the case that I've been asked to work out uh, or use two different even numbers. So if I'm using two different even numbers, then 2n and 2m would work. And it may be the case that once I've written 2n, I've been asked to work out or use a consecutive even number. So the next even number after 2n is 2n plus 2. And if I'm asked to use an odd number, then that'll be 2n plus 1. If I'm asked to use a different odd number, then I'd have to use 2n plus 1. 
Or if I was asked to use a consecutive uh, odd number, then I would use 2n plus 3. And if I'm asked just to list consecutive integers, then I could use n and n plus 1 and n plus 2. Or I might even consider n minus 1, just as long as they differ by 1, making them consecutive. Okay, proportion. So the symbol for proportionality is uh, essentially a fish. <laughs> uh, so y is proportional to x. Uh, but what's most important is that we create an equation from that information. And we do that by saying that y is equal to some constant multiplied by x. And from there, we can then find out what that constant is if we're given an x-y pair. If they are inversely proportional, then we say that y is proportional to 1 over x. And the equation that we can create is that y is equal to k over x. And then once again, when you're given an xy pair, you can then work out that constant of proportionality, k. For histograms, we have to remember the formula, and that is that frequency density is equal to frequency divided by class width. So however wide the interval is, and the frequency divided by that is going to give me the frequency density. And another way to remember it is that the area of the bar of a histogram is equal to its frequency. Similar shapes, we've touched on this slightly when we looked at units. But if we have uh, two similar shapes, we can uh, work out the, the scale factor in the first dimension, and we label that just k. We would do that by dividing, uh, let's say, the height of one uh, object by the height of the other, and that will give us the linear scale factor. But if we are converting between areas, the scale factor will be the linear scale factor squared. And if we're converting between volumes, it will be the linear scale factor cubed. OK, graph transformations. Like circle theorems, a lot to remember here. If we're adding uh, a value a to a function, then this is going to be a translation. And this will be up by um, the value a. Uh, if we're subtracting a, then this will be a translation. But it will be down again by a. And if we are inside the bracket taking away, then this will also be a translation, but this will be in the x direction as opposed to the y. And whenever we're inside the bracket, it always does the opposite of what you might think. So you would think minus a would mean to the left, but in fact, it means to the right when it's inside the bracket like that. So it follows that f of x plus a is going to be a translation uh, to the left by a. Now if I'm multiplying the function by a, then that is going to be a stretch. And, uh, and that's going to be in the y-axis. So we're going to be stretched upwards. And that is by a scale factor of a. And if we're inside the bracket, again, this is going to affect the x direction. But again, it's going to do the opposite of what you might think. So it's going to be a stretch in the x-axis, but it's by a scale factor of 1 over a. So in fact, it's going to compress the graph, essentially, rather than stretch it. And here we have minus f of x. Uh, this is a reflection in the x-axis. And if it's inside the bracket, it's a reflection in the y-axis. Uh, another good thing to remember is that if it happens outside the bracket, like these things, here, then these will always affect the um, the the y uh, coordinate, 
and if it happens inside the bracket like this, like this, and like this, then this will always affect the x coordinate. Okay, and moving on to thirds, if I uh, multiply two thirds together, it's the same as multiplying them underneath the same square root. And if I divide two thirds like this, we can split them up like that. If I need to rationalize a denominator and I've just have one third on the bottom like here, then I multiply top and bottom by root A. And if I need to rationalize a denominator where I have a third plus a rational number, then I need to multiply top and bottom by that third minus the rational number. And this works both ways. If there was a minus sign over here in red, then I'd have to change this one here to a plus sign. Um, sectors, so a section of a circle. If I need to work out the arc length, let's call it L and write L here. Then L is equal to theta over 360. So the angle that the sector makes over 360 gives me a fraction of the circle. And I multiply that by the circumference 2 pi r. And if I wanted to work out the area, I would again need to use that same fraction and I would multiply that by the area, which is pi r squared. Okay, moving on to uh, cones and spheres. Um, the volume of a cone is given in your formula booklet, but still good to know. It's one third pi r squared h. The curved surface area, again, is given in your formula booklet. This is pi r l, where l is the slanted height of the cone. And the total surface area will be the curved surface area, plus there is a base on the bottom, which we can't forget about, and that is a circle, so it has area pi r squared. The volume of a sphere is given, again, in your formula booklet. That's pi r, sorry, it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. And the surface area, again, is given, it's 4 pi r squared. Okay. Uh, the sine and cosine rules. So the sine rule is given in this form. A over sine capital A is equal to B over sine capital B. Um, A and B, the lower case being the side lengths and the upper cases being the angles. Now that's really useful when we're trying to find the side because all we need to do is just multiply it by sine capital A and that gives me little a. But if I need to work out the angles, it's better to write it uh, upside down, essentially, and have the sine of the angles on top and the sides on the bottom. So you're not given that, but it's important to know that you can do that flip. Cosine rule for sides, again, you're given this. It's a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared, similar to Pythagoras, but then minus 2bc cosine of capital A. What you're not given is the rearrangement method, which you would need if you tried if you needed to work out an angle. So I think it's important to learn this. It's cosine of capital A is equal to b squared plus the c squared minus a squared, all divided by 2bc. Okay, and the area of a triangle, you are given this. It is one half times a times b times sine of capital C. Uh, 3D Pythagoras, um, you might not know this one straight away, but there is a little shortcut to work out the long diagonal of a cuboid, and it's taking all three dimensions, squaring them, adding them together, and then square rooting your answer. So A squared plus B squared plus C squared, all square rooted, it's gonna give you the long diagonal of a cuboid. Uh, completing the square, there is a formula you could use, and that would be x plus b over 2, all squared minus b over 2, all squared plus c. I'm not sure actually if I recommend learning this formula or learning the one where we have an a in front of the x squared. Uh, it's not an easy formula to remember, 
uh, as I'm just about to show you now. I think it's probably easier just to learn the method of how to complete the square. And I have a video where I explain that in detail, which I think you should check out. Uh, what is important to remember though is that you can work out the minimum point of um, a, a quadratic when you're given it in completed the square form. And the minimum point is the solution, the x value, which makes this bracket zero. So in this case, it would be minus p. And then the y value of the minimum point is just whatever's added on to the bracket. So in this case, q. Um, and the symmetry line is x equal to whatever the x coordinate is of the minimum point. In this case, minus p. Perpendicular lines or perpendicular gradients, we need to remember that these uh, these are negative reciprocals. If two gradients are perpendicular, then also if two lines are perpendicular, then their gradients are the negative reciprocal of one another. And if I have one gradient and I want to find out gradient two, I can just do minus one divided by the first gradient, and that will give me the negative reciprocal. Now, if you are gunning for a grade 9 or want to take maths further, then I think it's a good idea to learn this formula for equation of a straight line. It's y minus y1 is equal to mx minus x1. It's a more efficient uh, equation than y equals mx plus c, and it's good to get to used to how to use that. Functions. Um, a domain is the set of all inputs or also known as the set of all the x values that the function can take. The range is the set of all outputs also known as the set of all the y values that the function can spit out. A common question is they ask what values need to be excluded from the domain and you need to know that what you can't do in maths is you can't square root a negative or you can't divide by zero. So we need to avoid these things or any x values which would uh, make these things occur. Uh, composite functions, uh, essentially doing a double function, f of g of x, what does this mean? It means do g first then do f. So the other way around, reading from right to left rather than left to right. And inverse functions, if I have uh, an output y is equal to an input into the function of f, then I know that the inverse function will just flip the x and the y over. So whenever you need to find the inverse function, we always flip the x for the y and then rearrange for y. Okay, if I have a, um, a function y is equal to ax to the n, to differentiate it, I multiply the power by the coefficient. So that will give me a n, and then I drop the power down by 1. Uh, stationary points occur when the gradient, so dy by dx, is equal to 0. When we have kinematics, we uh, most of the time start off with a displacement formula. And then once we differentiate that, that gives us velocity. And when we differentiate that, that gives us acceleration. Displacement is normally labelled as a S, velocity as a V, and acceleration as an A. Okay, let's move on to sequences. Um, you're not told what A, D, and N stand for. Um, a is the first term in a sequence. D is the common difference between the terms in the sequence. And N is the position of the term in the sequence. The summation formula you are given 
and that is the summation up to n is equal to n over 2, 2a plus n minus 1 multiplied by d. The formula for the nth term is really important to remember because all of the sequence questions basically use it, but you're not given it. And it is that the uh, term in the nth position is equal to the first term plus n minus 1 differences. Okay, and moving on to the final topic, which is vectors. Uh, in this form, the uh, vector of A to B is the same as the origin to B minus the origin to A. So essentially, if I want to go from A to B, I'll need to do B minus A. The magnitude of a column vector is notated like this, with two lines either side of the bracket. And what we need to do is we need to do a Pythagoras calculation by taking each component, squaring them, adding them together, and then working out the square root. Essentially, the magnitude is the distance that the vector travels. Parallel vectors are multiples of one another. Now, what does that look like in practice? Well, let's say that A, B, and C, D were parallel. Then A, B would equal some number, let's call it lambda, multiplied by C, D. So if I were to find that A, B was two times C, D, then those two vectors would be parallel. Collinear is a bit of a fancy word to saying that three points... ABC, for example, lie on the same straight line. Now, what does that mean in terms of our vectors? Well, it means that any two of AB, AC, or BC must be parallel. And if we can prove that any two of those are parallel, it means that A, B, C lie on a straight line. I hope you found that useful. If you go to my Google Drive, there is a blank copy of this document and there is also a completed copy of this document. I really recommend that you go through the blank copy and fill out all of the information. I think it's a really good way of being able to commit all of this information to memory. I've got lots more content on IGCSE and please do subscribe to the channel because once you've smashed this exam, got a grade 9 and doing A-level maths next year, you're going to want to check out all the great stuff that I've got on A-level maths as well. Good luck in your exam. Bye for now.